Florian said, we are um, doing um, stuff with aircraft transponder data and SCR. Um, first, a bit of what we are going to talk about today. So, um, I will tell a short, in short, um, how we come to this and what we do usually and stuff like that and what we plan to do. Then um, we have a look into how um, aircraft transponders are meant to work and how the communications go there. And a third part, we'll talk about a lot um, about this um, real tech um, chip for SDR, which um, Harald also told, told about in the last uh, talk, and have some more details for this um, $20 um, SDR hardware. Yeah. And uh, if you have short questions regarding understanding, um, just interrupt me. If you have some more discussion stuff, uh, we'll do it afterwards. So, yeah, let's go. So, um, we are um, Sebastian Koch, who sits here in the first row, and uh, me doing, um, or started out, actually, with the aircraft, aircraft transponder stuff, actually, um, for Sebastian, with the um, uh, computer security-related um, lab, and um, for me, working in with some guys from the um, from the uh, how is it called ATC and um, cockpit design um, department here at our university, um, and we actually st started the the application for displaying transponder data and all that stuff more or less just for fun, and also with us. Harald got involved and supported us, who is doing the camera and recording today. Um, so we want to thank him here. Yeah. So what we actually do, maybe lots of you saw our website and have clicked around and had a little fun with it. Um, actually, at the moment, we are having uh, small sensor network of these um, SDR sticks supporting our software and some other um, receivers for some transponder data. Um, and we try to use these data sources to compute um, aircraft positions and state to get not only just the position, but also make some predictions on um, Noise then, yeah, on noise levels, and um, have also a display of historic data on our website, so that if you just don't want to sit for a whole for a long time before it, just watching where the plane goes, you can also go back some days and have it in um, fast forward manner, so you see the patterns in the and what the ATC does with all the different flights. Yeah, and yeah, you just can try it out on the internet. So, how is it gonna work? Um, usually, aircraft transponder or aircraft transponder started out actually as an as enhancement to um, the normal radar. So, when the the plane was hit by a radar pulse. Um, there was at the beginning just a filter cascade which had a specific echo um, and this echo would be received at the um, ground station and could be transcoded in some um, yeah, identifier number or something. And over time the whole thing got more sophisticated and real hardware got in and processors got in and nowadays we also have these um, question-reply uh, style communication um, for the transponder, but there's also some, a thing called ADSB, where the B is for broadcast. Um, 
and where planes just broadcast out things like their position, like their um, speeds. Um, there are also messages um, what on their state and what they intend to do next. And they are also like, if you think of collision avoidance and such stuff, they are not only um, messages going between the base station and the aircraft, but also between aircrafts and aircrafts. Yeah, kind of funny stuff to look at it. It's broadcast and there have been, at least in Germany, legislation that it's legal to um, listen to the broadcasts. So you can just have fun with it as long as you don't interfere um, with the traffic. So how does it look like? Here's an example. I assume you have all seen it. Um, when you click on a specific plane on the map, you get also more details on what we have received or what we have computed. Um, and you see something, um, the blue contour, um, what we believe is the area where you hear the plane louder than in this case. I assume you can't read it from behind than 60 de decibel. Um, so we make a prediction where you would hear it. Um, in this small, uh, yeah, in the small box below, um, you see what we received. And but I'll go first what um, ADSB or transponder data usually um, are sent over via radio. So it's um, as you see here, it's roughly above one gigahertz. And we have also had a certain, yeah, it's, it's been a bit difficult because it's um, rather at the specification limits of these cheap um, radio receivers. But anyway, we can do it. It's um, mainly AM, or it's AM um, modulated stuff with um, about two megahertz bandwidth, which is, uh, yeah, for normal software defined radio, okay, but for these receivers, it's the bandwidth you can handle um, if you make some efforts, but it's not that easy to get this high bandwidth decoded. Um, it, it's, it's this ADSB are very, very short messages, so you have not much time you have really to listen hard to, but you have uh, short bits of high bandwidth there. Yeah, and we have the luck of that it's not a kind of a data stream, but it's, uh, it's these are all only short packets which are repeatedly sent, so if you miss some, it's not that bad because you can just go on and wait for the next bit of information coming through. So in the in the picture, you see um, a red box which marks the data we actually receive from a specific plane. Um, and all the stuff below that is computed using um, some tables and databases and some knowledge about um, the actual physics of a plane and such stuff. Um, but uh, we think it's um, interesting information if you are on the site, so we wouldn't want to keep it uh, from you. Um, yeah, here are some options how you can um, do ADSB um, according to our knowledge. And so the, the most common, some years ago, we are some commercial um, receivers, there are different variants, here's just one, but they are also about 400 to 600 euro if you want to uh, buy them. You just get a box and the software and usually connect it via USB network, whatever, and um, can see what's going on on your PC. Then there has, have been some custom-made um, do-it-yourself receivers with different kits, 
which you have to solder yourself or get the SMD parts pre-assembled um, and such stuff. There's an um, um, FP FPGA solution which um, is, has the best performance we've at least seen in this domain, and it's, but it's also quite expensive if you just want to do it as student for hobby. Um, and nowadays, of course, we have uh, this uh, cheap SDR um, receivers where you only need some box which does a um, signal processing and decoding of the messages. Um, and we are working to do it with such a, a cheap um, normal VLAN um, router so you can get an um, ADSB receiver for something around um, 50 euro. We are not done yet with it, so we hope we can um, really present the thing which you just plug in and it goes, but um, I fear we have to work on it for some weeks till it gets ready. Um, but at least we have some demo today so you can, can see what's going on there. Um, so now I want to go a little into the detail of these, uh, of how software defined radio works. I'm not um, sure how many of you actually have been involved with this and know how a software defined radio receiver works. Um, so, yeah, okay, some, some of you actually have experience in that. So the, the normal thing is you've just, um, you receive your signal via, via some antenna and have a preamp to, to get it to a pagel um, and to a level you can handle um, and have not, get not so much noise in it. And then there's usually um, um, a so-called mixer stage where you have your original si uh, signal and multiply it um, in the usual case with the frequency, uh, frequency um, you want to receive and you get a, um, a different signal um, which then can is um, only the, the part of the spectrum you're kind of interested in. So um, you, can, uh, you can see it as if you're translating a part of a higher or a higher part of the spectrum just down to around zero. So um, then you can just use a normal low pass filter to get this chunk of spectrum and um, put it into an uh, analog digital converter. Usually you do it with two channels where one is, um, you, as you can imagine, um, as a, an imag uh, imaginary number. So one is the imaginary part and the other is a real part. Usually it's called IQ um, decoding or um, signal. So you, have, you can use this to, um, to show or to get the spectrum just from a, from a positive um, frequency to a negative frequency, which wouldn't be uh, possible um, if you just had only one channel. And in our case, oh, whoops, um, this happens in the two chips. You can also see on the second screen where the, um, where the uh, USB stick is opened, um, you see two um, dark chips, I think I showed here. So you have um, the tuner, you know, the, the, the ADC and USB controller here, and you have um, the tuner chip, um, which is this one. Oh, sorry, I, I mixed it up. So actually here's the um, antenna. You got the tuner chip here, and you get the ADC and USB chip here, and there are some other components, but you can actually see also the, um, as in the hardware from Osmo SDR, the four lines which represent the uh, Q and I channels. Yeah. 
Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, right. So, yeah, then it's, it corresponds to the image there. Um, and the first chip does, as you see, the mixing and filtering. There's more to it. Um, so there are more filters and more um, amplifiers where you can play around. Um, but there are also different chips of it, so I won't get into detail there, but I want to get into detail for the second one, which is uh, actually ADC and um, USB chip. So you see there is not, not only um, a part which, own, which decodes the D4BT directly, uh, the D4BT, but also there is an output where you can get the signal um, directly. Um, unfortunately, you won't get the whole bandwidth this chip receives. So there's um, a down conversion just before the USB here. So you have to have um, um, also a low pass filter which kind of um, takes away a bit of your spectrum. Because um, originally this um, ADC here runs with the um, crystal frequency of about um, 28.8 megahertz, but afterwards you will get out something between um, 0 0.9 and 3.2 mega samples, which is quite a bit for such a sh uh, cheap hardware. So you can do most of the signal processing stuff f you find in common um, communication protocols. You can't um, look digital TV with that, therefore you will need the special hardware because bandwidth is too high, but for, yeah, as we mentioned, maybe GMS, and there have even been people who do uh, GPS um, um, receiving with this hardware. No, it's... Um, uh, okay, so the question was if there is a JTAG to this um, Realtek chip, um, and there's not even really documentation to this real tech chip, one has to say. So unless you um, sign an NDA and that stuff we had uh, heard about. Um, so the point is where we got our knowledge from is mainly the um, kernel driver, which were published from some developers. Um, I, if I'm right, belonging to Elonix, which built the Tuna or to Realtek, I'm not quite sure, but there was actually a driver for this. And we've also to thank um, the Osmo SDR project um, because they had a um, new radio block for it so we could experiment with that stuff and get our hands on before writing our own software for it. But later more on that, yeah. Yeah, so you actually got this real tech chip. There's also a little um, amplifier before the ADC, but it makes more noise than it does good in our case. Then you just got this fast ADCs, and you can almost directly interface the USB. Inter uh, or, yeah, it's almost directly interfaced with USB in a certain mode. You only have to um, yeah, live with this um, low-pass filter in between but uh, the good message is you can also tune this low-pass filter there even if it has uh, only a limited amount of coefficients, so you can't um, do arbitrary um, filter functions there. Yeah, as I mentioned, um, we, where we got our knowledge from or where we started off was mainly this kernel driver which were, was published and um, also we had a lot or spent a lot of time with GNU radio with such plots like that. Um, and you can, it's actually on um, 1090 megahertz and you see this horizontal lines in there 
which are actually ADSB or um, transponder datagrams, and you need only to demodulate them via uh, AM and yeah, read the Manchester code, and then you can get through it. And uh, we had then built our own software and used a lot of yeah, common stuff like new plot um, to see how signal forms are and such things. Um, and doing that, um, we had, or we hit certain limitations of that hardware, which were at first um, the, yeah, the gains of the different amplifiers in there. There's a lot of automated, uh, of automated gain control going on, which is actually um, tailored towards a continuous strong signal. And if you have, as um, the slide before, such spikes and only short packet datagrams, this uh, doesn't work really well. So we had to tune them off first. And it's quite a bit of fiddling by now to get things right in kind, uh, uh, regarding gain and stuff. So that's what we're working currently on. Then there's a problem um, with transfer uh, rate, so the USB interface of the real check has some dropouts on high sampling rates. I'll come to that in a minute. And as I told you, there's a um, down uh, there's downsampling going on in the real tech chip, um, and there's a FER filter which has only um, 32 coefficients, I think. So, um, and if you are Keep in mind that you're downsampling from about of yeah, bandwidth of 28.8 megahertz down to uh, let's say two or 2.4 megahertz. Um, 32 coefficients are not very much for a filter function because uh, you have to do a low pass there. It's not that easy. Um, yeah, and then I have to mention, we usually use a specific tuner. It's a Elonix um, E4000, which has a kind of the best, um, or, or the, yeah, it has the best gain, as far as we know, and also has the broadest range of frequency. But it has a, it, it works and not continuous from, let's say, 50, Four, five megahertz to, I don't know, two gigahertz, but it has in that range a band gap which goes from thousand and, yeah, if you're lucky, lucky thousand and ninety five to, um, I don't know, thousand and two hundred megahertz. So there's a small range which you can't receive because of the internals of the chip, um, mainly the VC, uh, VCO. And we just hit that gap um, with our ADSB transponder messages. So, yeah, it's a bit of fiddling also and um, finding the right tuner which, where the variations of the hardware are okay. Yeah, I spoke. Up. Ah, okay, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So, if you want to know how big your band gap is and such stuff, um, the guys from Osmocom and um, Osmo SCR have a small test program where you can just um, let it run and see what your cheap um, SDR hardware is capable of. So it's actually what happens there is they just try all the, f the frequencies and tr uh, or try to tune it and see if the PLL locks and if it doesn't, you know, um, um, you can't tune that frequency anymore. So here are some data on what sampling rates you can achieve and how the error or the dropout rates are. So we, we have uh, done um, a calibration program on, or we have, I should start another way, we have started to um, implement the a kernel driver for the RTL um, 2833, and therefore we also wrote a calibration program after some time. There were some 
some base for this chip for D4PT um, receiving, but not for um, software-defined radio. And as we wanted to get the time and a more exact timing, uh, we started to write our own module here. And from this module, uh, this data. So what you can see is actually, you if you rely on a continuous stream of data with no dropouts, you can only use this chip um, until 2.4 mega samples, and if you if you go up with the sampling rate, you will have to cope with some dropouts. Um, yeah, so you have to see what your application is. There's also something that the gain goes down a little when you use higher sampling rates. But if you rely on high sampling rate, well, this is an option to just cope with it. And as we um, did first or look closer on it, um, we discovered that the data is transmitted in um, 500, uh, 512 byte um, chunks via the USB bus. And so we look closer at these 512 byte chunks and you see that the, the probability of errors occurring is in, so in this, in, in this diagram you just see the, the count from the first um, byte in this buffer till the last byte and you see that in the middle of the chunk the error probability is highest so you can, can kind of guess where things might go wrong if you want to try to fight with these dropouts. Yeah. So what to do about that? At first, um, we didn't, um, also we had some problems with this. We don't think you would want just to abandon this device because the price point um, versus the uh, capability is just too good. And the, the most simple solution is, if you can, just stay below 2.4 mega samples. Um, if you don't, well, you have to go fighting with these dropouts. And what we also discovered is that you can detect these dropouts because if you're in the kernel and have quite a um, high CPU clock, you have also relative precise timing and you can actually see um, that a certain buffer or a certain, um, yeah, a certain transfer took longer time than you expected and so you could, um, you could guess that there's something going wrong. This of course only works if you're doing small transfers. Um, but, and we are currently looking into that, but it's not so simple, so we haven't yet fully prepared it to work in, uh, let's say, production. Yeah, and the, the last thing is you can just have more of these devices because they are obviously cheap and um, use them in some way which is depending on your application to just get more coverage and cope with this stuff. And um, what we, as I mentioned, what we are trying to do is just take these um, rather cheap rotors and um, flash them with an OpenVRT software and bring your SDR application in there. Of course, there is a bit of optimization needed, which you usually don't do if you're just using um, GNU Radio because GNU Radio is fine to just plug into uh, your plug together your demodulation demodula and all that stuff. But if you have figured it out, you, have, you would or we try to um, rewrite the software so that it also fits on this hardware and we are um, yeah, quite success, successful with that, I must say. Um, yeah, we are currently running three of these uh, receivers um, as we'll see in in a minute. Yeah. So now for the for the demo as I told you. So 
so yeah in English is better and we have our normal uh, map as you can see our, um, from our website um, but we have also prepared one which uses this embedded um, STR receivers let's see if it works uh, so we will also have a debug mode here where you can see from which transmitter which uh, message came. Mm -hmm. So let's see, uh, go away. Um, uh, just fighting with a touchpad. Um, Uh, it won't let me. So you see um, our range of um, transmission and you see small um, small text on each um, position report um, we got from the planes. So you can kind of guess that there are more than one um, receiver just involved in receiving this stuff for Sebastian tells me. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, any questions up until here? I have a lot of more, um, I've, of, yeah, we, we can go into certain areas into more detail, but I had, it's, at, uh, um, Till here, we've almost told you a, um, an overview with some details we thought we, which might interest you. So if you have any questions, um, we are happy to answer them. Yeah. Um, well, this is, remains uh, in discussion. Usually, I'd say, um, well, if you, if you just want to test or, or play around, it's enough to just grab some some wires this size and plug it in and you will receive some um, aircrafts. And um, as far as I'm, yeah, actually, I'm not too much into this um, high frequency stuff. I've got a kind of idea and I've taken some courses in electrical engineering, but I'm not the expert in this. So we've also built something like a collinear antenna and such stuff, which gives quite good results, but um, yeah, just have a try and see what other people do, which do um, um, yeah, receiving and antenna stuff. So usually the size is okay. Yeah. Do you see all airplanes or only the passenger airplanes or do you see all passenger airplanes? Are there sports aircrafts that you don't see because they don't have transponders? Um, yeah, um, we only show, uh, so there's, we only show civil um, aircrafts, of course. There's one message type reserved for uh, military aircrafts, but there's also not much traffic from what I can tell. And there's a certain uh, weight, uh, weight limit um, at which you are, um, uh, what's it called, at which you have, have to have a transponder. I think it's uh, about seven tons, Sebastian tells me. Um, so you can actually say nowadays almost all civil aircrafts have to be equipped with transponder. Sports aircrafts, uh, it's kind of rare. So you usually won't see them. Okay, I think no more questions. This far, you're not finished, right? Hmm? You're not finished with the talk, right? Um, I've, I've actually brought you all. I would tell, uh, I have to uh, talk about uh, as an overview. There's only detailed stuff if somebody wants to know. So we could tell you a bit about um, flight um, mechanics and how we calculate stuff. We can tell you a bit about noise. Um, calculation. Hmm? Nice. Okay, so yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Steam, where my slides are, are here. So yeah, on noise. So what we actually do there is, um, you see the blue boxes with um, where with the data we actually receive via radio. Um, and we use this um, to compute um, with together with a model of the aircraft and the white, we est estimate um, to compute engine trust. And from the trust you'd need in this um, flight situation, um, we compute the noise level on the on an observer position or um, su as such contour as you have seen on the map. So the white is my mainly um, we we estimate it on the maximum landing weight because the aircraft nowadays are built in such an efficient manner that they are usually there's a very very small weight margin. Um, which on which you are allowed uh, to land above the um, maxi or yeah, below the maximum landing weight. So yeah, so it's a the kind of um, simplification we do there. Um, and we have certain we assume certain profiles um, on speed and on height to to guess or and compute the flight phase because also the, the speed march as uh, the speed ranges in which an airplane may operate safely are also um, at least for the for the landing phase very um, thin so you can use that to get uh, information about the the configuration so the flaps of the plane the landing gear and all that stuff yeah and then you actually do um, an, a calculation of the of the noise propagation. There have been um, people who who actually built tables from from that, so you have the possibility to interpolate the noise and um, for certain distances. And uh, usually, you assume normal temperatures in like in um, between in spring or in um, autumn and there may be a little offset in, in when it's very hot or very cold and depending on the uh, moisture of the air but usually the, the estimations we have are quite okay. Yeah. Uh, I have another question from the IRC channel. Um, somebody's asking how well are these protocols protected against spoofing, especially the ones used for TCAS, uh, collision avoidance, e.g. could you inject a ghost plane that would trick TCAS to, uh, into issuing a collision warning? Um, as well as, or as far as we know, there is no such thing as signature or any protection to them. So if you make it to spoof them, um, you have a good chance of um, having a serious attack there. But what you have to take into consideration is that um, the aircrafts have also very strong um, sending units. So if you consider a normal um, um, passenger aircraft, we are speaking about something in between, I don't know, 150 watts and uh, 250 watts or something as um, transmission power. So if you have a TKS event, they are actually close by. And um, um, yeah, it's very, this is very hard. And there are also other systems like um, directed antennas, which help the plane to detect from where the transmi transmission has come and to get some idea about the angle. I'm not too much into the details of that, but you can certainly um, read it up. Um, I'll have to find, um, okay, just wait a minute. You have, mm -hmm, let me see, there's a much more ADSB stuff. Um, yeah, if you're interested in that, 
you might, where is it? Uh, no, I've, I don't find this. So they are actually documents from the ICAO. Um, I think it's um, volume four, annex 10, or other way, way around, um, where they actually describe this protocol. Um, the best source for this documentation at the moment is um, the Swiss um, Department for Air Traffic. I'm not sure how it's, the real name is. They have them published on their website, so you just can read through. It's kind of the thing with um, uh, GSM, where you have tons of specification and you just have to find the right page uh, or the right pages and put them together. Okay, another question from the IRC channel. How precise is the posi position being sent? Could it used by terrorists to attack airplanes? Well, it's a rather complicated um, way to do that. I mean, the, the point is the, the position of the aircraft is, uh, the aircraft specifies actually in a bit field how precise his position is. And usually, um, we talk about something in the range of some hundred meters. Um, usually, but we see that the positions are, in most cases, actually precise on a range of some 10 meters. So that's the accuracy you can, might expect. And I think if you really have bad intentions, um, you will you won't need an ADSB trans uh, receiver um, to get the position of an aircraft. Okay, wait. Okay, uh, let's assume I have a SDR setup already working, and I would like to contribute to a project to populate the map. Uh, what kind of protocol are you using? What should I do to stream data for your project? Um, by now, we are unfortunately not in, in the shape of um, um, you that you can contribute to us now, but we are actually preparing um, an interface for that. And also, um, as we have a kernel module, we all actually intend to uh, publish that, so you might have an... Um, yeah, you can also start doing SDR directly from a kernel driver. Um, yeah, we actually hope we have some some days an an OpenVRT image for these routers, so you just can plug it together and get it running on OpenVRT. Um, did you ever try to receive a signal from within the plane? No, actually not. <laughs> I haven't flown since then, so yeah. Any more questions? So there is none in the ERC. Um, I suppose, thanks for your talk. Um.